Our vision and heart here at Camarillo Community Church is to see the increasing number of people who live in our area to know and follow Jesus Christ. Five years ago, Camarillo Community Church hired myself, my wife, and our children to come be the new lead pastor of our church. Since we've been here, we've done 15 community impact initiatives. 76 people have been baptized and 113 people have made decisions for Christ. But I wanna let you know something. We don't believe we're done there. We believe God wants to do so much more with our church in this community. Did you know that 71,000 people live in the Camarillo area? Many of those don't go to church. Challenge before us is how do we take our legacy of 60 years of successful gospel ministry, teaching of the word as our history, and how do we pull that forward to the next generation? You may not know this, but most churches have about a 50 to 60 year window and then the church closes. We call that a life cycle of a church. How do we go from one life cycle to another life cycle? How do we bridge the gap from what was so successful here and make it successful again? One of the ways that you can build momentum is to refresh, rebuild, kind of refresh vision on the campus. You may have done this in your own home life as well. You take the kitchen and you redo it. And it just refreshes the whole kitchen and makes it feel new. And then you bring new people in and they all enjoy it. I don't know if you've ever been to a restaurant where they have reestablished themselves or a new grand opening and people come just because they want to see the new ownership of what's done inside. Those are the kind of things that we're talking about that we believe we can provide ourselves momentum with as we refresh our campus. That's why we have embarked on what we're calling the Welcome Project. And we're so excited uh, for all of us to consider how God might be calling us, challenging us to stretch a little bit more for His kingdom, for His glory. And we believe in doing so, we might get a new influx of people, people who are new to our community, buying these homes, people who are here looking for a fresh start, people who are looking for a place to raise their children in a church home. Church is not a building, it's about building people. And our facilities are just a tool for that greater vision. As our area continues to grow and increasing with people in Camarillo and really the Ventura County area, we would love to see more of those folks come to know Jesus Christ, and that's why we're doing this. I'm so excited how God will stretch my family and how what we can give and sacrifice for so that new people, new family, new children can come to know Jesus Christ. And I'm hoping that all of us together, that you'll join us in this process that as you deliberate and say, God, I'm gonna put you in my finances, I'm gonna put you in my budget so that we can do something together that we could never do apart and that we can make a dent in the kingdom of God right here in Camarillo. I hope that you'll take this time and join us in excitement and prayerful expectation as to what God and how God might use you for this endeavor. Would you stand with me, church, as we read God's word together? So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. In your generous love, I'm really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence here walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief a man of sorrow a song of suffering blood and tears how can there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of suffering, some imagine you distant and removed, but you chased us down and merciful 
He's not done with what he started He's not done until it's good Listen that again, church Oh, let him turn it in your favor Watch him work it for your good He's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. Sing this out. Hello.
be able to spend eternity with you. I pray that you would remind us of that great blessed assurance.
Our vision and heart here at Camarillo Community Church is to see the increasing number of people who live in our area to know and follow Jesus Christ. The challenge before us is how do we take our legacy of 60 years of successful gospel ministry and how do we pull that forward to the next generation? That's why we've embarked on what we're calling the Welcome Project. I hope that you'll take this time and join us in excitement and prayerful expectation as to what God and how God might use you for this endeavor. We've been coming to the church since uh, about 93 or 94. His sister actually was attending along with her husband. They had yes. kept inviting us and we finally decided to, to attend. Uh, when we look for a church, we look first of all for a church that's biblically based, that's teaching what the Bible teaches and doesn't sway with the cultural winds. We had been going to a church in Ventura, um, but we had moved to Camarillo, and so we were kind of thinking was, we need to come and start coming to church in the local community. So in, in the past, we've actually um, were very active um, as far as like doing Awanas. We, I was a leader. We did social clubs where we were always doing like dinner groups. Bob and I actually come from humble beginnings. Um, we, we grew up in Oxnard. My, my parents actually used to, you know, drop a few dollars in the, the basket as it went along, which kind of did start, you know, maybe that was my start in, in seeing like, okay, my family's doing this, I, I would want to continue that. So I've always felt like giving back was important. You know, the meals, we always had food on our table and whatnot. I just know looking back that it was like very humble beginnings and, you know, paycheck to paycheck for them and it's very similar to how we started out. And like I said, they would give the drop in the bucket or whatever that they could in faith because it's not like they had a whole lot to give, but they gave it. And in turn, it taught me to, to let go, you know, it's okay. You know, we had many meals where we had cornbreads and beans, government cheese to eat. Um, and so when we got money, and this is how I learned finances, is we got the money, we spent it because we didn't know if we were gonna have that money again to actually say, you know, we're gonna trust that God is going to provide for us even though we're giving back um, was not an easy decision at first, but I can tell you this, that when he says he'll provide, he provides, and he has given us so much more than we ever could invest. Um, back in the day when they started the project, you know, to build this church, we were here as well. We, you know, stepped out in faith, again, because we didn't have a whole lot, and we decided to jump on board. And um, actually saw the fruit of the, the giving, you know, the, the, it was built, a lot more people started coming, we made more friends, it was just really nice to be part of. And know that we had a part in it. We gave and you know, got to see that through. So with the, the next step, the original building campaign for this building that we're in um, was proposed. Um, the leadership of the church had said, uh, do, we're getting to a point where the space that we have is not conducive to today's uh, culture, to today's people, what they're looking for in a church. On the flip side, what we saw was people coming to the church and saying, what's going on here? There's something exciting happening here. Uh, uh, this is something we haven't seen in this community before. And being able to engage with those people and, and meet those people and talk with those people. We're super excited about this. If this uh, Welcome Project can do the same sort of thing, can bring people to the church, people that wouldn't normally come, uh, we're just super excited about having them come and, and experience what we have here. For me, it's supposed to be like a revival almost of the church. You know, here we go. Let's let's reach out to newcomers, give them a place to sit, give them a place to be outside and get excited about. Let's um, bring new faces. And you know, it's not about taking people away from other churches. It's about bringing people that have no church home. I have to say we're really excited about this Welcome Project initiative. Would you please prayerfully consider how God might be calling you to give above and beyond your normal gifts to this endeavor? As you notice in your envelope that you've received in the top right hand corner, it gives the option to give an enclosed gift for today. We're asking everyone to give a one-time gift at the beginning of the project and then to also consider what they might be able to do above and beyond their normal gifts on a monthly level for 36 months as well. 
So if you take, for example, my gift in close today, let's say it's $1,000, and then I, in addition to that, I think I can give another $100 a month. When you added up the 36 months together, that'd be $3,600 plus the $1,000 of the initial gift. My total commitment to the Welcome Project would be $4,600. Now we know there's people who won't be able to give that, and then we know there's people who can give a lot more than that. And together, as we all sacrifice together, we're hoping to be able to find the Lord's favor and be able to move our church forward with this initiative. Please consider how God might be calling you and your family to be used in this endeavor and return this envelope to us anytime within the next four weeks. Hey, welcome to Camarillo Community Church. We are so glad that you are with us. We are on week four of Commitment Month, and so we're super excited what that means for us. We'll have like a commitment or a celebration Sunday sometime in December, and we'll unveil what the Lord uh, did through us together as we sacrifice for this wonderful cause. I don't know where we're at. Kenny won't even tell me because I'm a blabber, and I'll say where we're at, and I'm not supposed to do that, so I don't even know where we're at. But I, I know that we had our leaders of our church give the first or 600,000, and we're hoping uh, we have a goal of 1.3 million. We're going to see what God does with us in, uh, in, in the next coming weeks or so. So uh, if you came today ready to give, awesome. You brought an envelope. You forgot your envelope. That's okay. We bought 25 million envelopes, so we can get you another one on your way out today, and uh, we certainly want to be a part of that uh, and, and be a part of that with us. This is obviously a week you don't want to miss, so you're glad you're here. If you're online, we're glad you're with us as well. We see you. We have something special planned for the very, very end. But I want to say, before we get started, come back next week. We're, we're doing a new series uh, for kind of the Christmas se season called It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas. It'll be fun together. Uh, and we're going to be looking at all the items that we kind of, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the, like the candy canes and, the, and, the, uh, and the, the stockings and the trees and the hollies and all that stuff. And we're going to look at the spiritual significance of each. I don't know, as I was studying this, if you know that there's spiritual significance tied to all these items, we just think of it as Christmas time, but there are actually some spiritual significance tied to them all. So great opportunity for you to bring a friend. Maybe somebody doesn't, wouldn't usually come to church. Great season. Uh, we have Michael Buble singing. It's beginning to look like a Christmas. It's going to be an awesome time. So uh, we'll do that starting next week. Come back. For those of you guys who are new, maybe you're here for the first week this week. Uh, oh, hi, welcome. Uh, my name's David. Welcome to our church. I'll be out afterwards on the patio meeting people. Please come say hello. But you're wondering what is this welcome project all about? So on the screens. You're going to see some pictures. You saw a little bit in the video. We're, we're just trying to refresh the campus a little bit in, in, in hopes that we'll build some momentum and really say to our community, you're welcome here. We want you here. Some new curb appeal, uh, some new places that would have some seating areas. And one of the difficult parts of, uh, of uh, unless you're in this building, there's not a lot of place to sit. And so we wanted to have, you know, not just to come and go home, but come and hang out for a little while. And so we have that there. And so we kind of expand the patio and whatnot. I want to show you these pictures in the patio, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, um, the lobby, because I was showing you the wrong pictures all month long, and Kenny was like, stop showing those pictures. The pictures that I was showing were kind of like pink tile, and they kind of look lame. We changed that like six months ago, and I grabbed the wrong pictures. That's the color of the real tile. That's the CTL tile. It's kind of reddish, more deeper, and, and it's, it looks a lot better than the other pictures I was showing the weeks before, so I'm sorry about that. That was an old rendition, old pictures, uh, but uh, that's what it'll actually look like. And again, we have pictures all over the place that you can continue to look at. You know, when we first unveiled this, we asked the leaders of our church, the people who are, who are, 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 are kind of uh, knee-deep involved in our church, to come to a vision meeting, and we unveiled this. And we had a Q&A time and whatnot. And I did something that I haven't done with the church I think I want to do today. And then as I said to them, hey, I'm these are about 30 or 40 people at all these little vision meetings. And I said, how many of you have been to the Wayfield Mall in, in Ventura in the last six months? And, and about, you know, a couple of smattering of hands would raise their hands. I said, would you look around? And we all noticed there's about 10% the people in the room had been to the Wayfair Mall in, in, in Ventura in the last six months. And I go, okay, put your hands down. And, and the rest of you, uh, how many of you guys have been to the, uh, the Oxnard City, the collection in, in Oxnard? And raise your hand. And as I asked everybody to raise their hand, we saw there was like 80% of the crew that was there had been to the Oxnard, out, the Oxnard outside collection uh, that they had there. And I said, isn't that interesting? We make choices on where we shop based on how we feel about the entity. 
Uh, so if, 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 why, why would we go to Oxnard over, why would we go, why would we go to the collection versus the Wayfair Mall? Well, you know what, it's just that newer feel, the ambiance is nicer, it feels younger, it's more modern, uh, you know, all these other things. I don't want to go and walk on tile that's been there for 30 years at the other place. And the interesting thing about that is you might be able to buy the same shoes that you got at the collection for cheaper at the Wayfair Mall. And yet you still, we still make decisions on where we shop based on how we feel about the environment of where we're at. You know, Kenny, our executive pastor, took a, a across the country trip with his son uh, recently, and he was passing by all these, what he would classify as looking like dead looking churches. Like they're just, they, they look dead. They look like that nobody's going there. I mean, the kind of place where you look, obviously, there has not been like a paintbrush hit that building in 20, 30 years. It's so very clear that they haven't re-landscaped or have a master plan for their landscaping since the inaugural Sunday of that building some 50 years ago. And those churches are seemingly are dying. And he said to himself, I wonder what it is about those churches that allowed them to end up in this situation. And as he was coming home and deliberating on this, he said, you know what I think it is? Dave, what I think it is, is the idea that we can always get to that later. We can always get to that later. We'll get to that later. We could change this, but we can get that later. Well, you know, we'll just pass this off and get to that later. I want to tell you something, church. We're not wanting to be a leadership that says, let's get to that later. We're wanting to be a leadership that says, let's get to that right now. And let's let these new families who are coming into the community and coming uh, into our area in droves say, this is a place for you. And so that's why we're doing the Welcome Project. Uh, uh, you know, this last week, I don't know if you know this, but our pantry served 160 families. If you've been a part of our church uh, for the last five and a half years since I've been here, and I know this is a history and legacy of tradition of our church, we've given over, you know, a quarter of a million dollars to entities outside of our church. Whether it's, you know, a crisis pregnancy, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, human trafficking, whether it's, you know, church planting here and abroad, whether it's homeless issues, whatever it might be, we've galvanized our people to make a dent in our community and do something for the kingdom of God. And one of the things that we do every week that we don't talk about probably enough is we serve the families in our community that are in need. We had 160 families last week come and get some kind of a turkey, you know, um, uh, offering at our pantry. That is up uh, um, about, you know, we usually serve about 135 families a week. On Friday, uh, we served 160. It makes sense in the sense that it's you know Thanksgiving season, and so uh, there's a spike in in need for sure. Did you know pre-pandemic, before the pandemic happened, we served about 100 to 110 families a week. So since COVID, we've seen the need rise. And as the need has risen, we've also seen that food share, which is a government cooperative that kind of uh, gets uh, um, uh, grocery stores to give their day-old food to us so we can give to people who are in need. We've seen that food share, the amount of food coming from food share go down. Something about the supply chain, something about post-COVID, post-pandemic, something about that that's, uh, that's depressed the amount of food that we receive, and yet we're seeing an influx of the need that we have. A couple months ago, my wife, um, who runs the pantry for our church, was there, and she had saw like the record lowest amount of food that we have ever received from food share. And she texted me in tears, um, disappointed that she's going to have these families she's not going to be able to give food to. And, uh, and she, she takes it in as if it's her job to feed all of Camarillo. And I'm like, that's not your job, <laughs> to feed all of Camarillo. It's just to give the food that we have away, because I want her to be happy. Anyway, so she, she took this in on herself, and she's taking all this, and she just decided to start texting anybody she knew in our church. And she uh, called uh, growth groups and texted people and put something on the Camarillo Cares page and, and any way she can get the information out. And, uh, and I remember visiting the pantry that day, and one of the pantry volunteers who doesn't go to our church but volunteers at our pantry every week came up to me and goes, do you know how awesome your church is? I go, wow, tell me more. <laughs> he goes, your wife put out like five text messages, put something on Facebook, social media, and all of a sudden people are coming out of the woodwork. There was 100 loaves of bread that were bought. There was eggs over here. There was meat. All these people just keep on coming and bringing food, and not one family that showed up that day didn't have something to leave with because of your church and because of this texting. Yeah. He goes, you should tell your church how awesome they are. I'm like, you're right. I will tell them how awesome they are. They are awesome. And you should go to our church and leave that lame church that you're at. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say, I didn't say that. I'm sure it's a great church. It's a wonderful church. They're just not as cool as us. And so, 
I wanted to thank everyone who was in a growth group this week, everybody who was in an AVF, Adult Bible Fellowship, everybody who was just a, uh, even single families that heard about the need this week and said, I'll go buy a turkey and I'll go buy a, a, a whole chicken. I'll go buy eggs. I'll go. There's so many things that got listed. My wife gave me this whole like, you know, 50,000 word text about things that were given this week so that we could make sure that everybody, the 160 families that showed up this week had something for Thanksgiving. Somebody even said, you know what? Here's some Denny's gift cards in case there's anybody who's homeless who doesn't have a kitchen. I want them to have a Thanksgiving meal. Thank you for that. It's awesome. It's one of the most beautiful things about our church. One of the things that we're doing this next year is we're going to make a CAMCC magnet that'll go on your refrigerator, and the magnet will allow you to see the need that we're collecting for that month. So January, we're collecting this item. February, we're collecting this item. March, we're collecting this item. And you can put that on your uh, refrigerator, and you'll know the whole year, 2023, what is the pantry collecting as we continue to see an influx of more people in need, and we're seeing a depression in the amount of food that's available. If you want to help us, and there's some people who love doing that, you're welcome to help us with that, and we'll give you that magnet, and uh, I'm sure the Lord will bless that whole entity and that whole movement. Now, this is a story that's near and dear to my heart. And the reason it's near and dear to my heart, because I was a kid who got a knock on the door when I was 14 or 15 years old and received a turkey basket for Thanksgiving. Had a single parent mother who was a victim of a violent crime. She had two broken arms and splint fingers and wounds in her head that took six months to heal and sutures and stitches and all these things. We went bankrupt. It was a horrible season. To this day, I wish she was alive and asked her, how did we pay the rent? You didn't work for six months. How do we make it? I still don't know. I have no clue. But there was this Christian organization that somehow found out about us, showed up at our house with a turkey basket. I didn't even know how we were going to cook it. My mom didn't have hands. But it was add water, stuffing, add water, mashed potatoes, add water, gravy, a turkey, a tin, some pie filling. We want you to have Thanksgiving. I often think to myself, if people knew the environment and neighborhood that I grew up in as a kid, they'd be, I, like, I won't let my own kids, I wouldn't let them walk down the street where I grew up. And there was this Christian organization that came by and gave us a box of turkey. And I often wonder to myself, did they pray before? Like maybe they prayed over our family before they even hit our door. And something they'll never know that standing on the other side of the door, the kid who received the box and put it in the kitchen and quickly closed the door because he was so humiliated at the whole thing, that kid would become a pastor. And that kid's pastor's wife would run a food pantry and galvanize the people of that church to make sure that people who are in need could have. Did they ever know that this morning, 30 years later, I would be praying for them. I don't even remember their faces. I just remember there's three or four of them. And I still pray God's blessing on them for that act of kindness, for that act of mercy, when we are in so much need. You see, sometimes embodied in our generosity is the very involvement of God. Embodied in our generosity is the very involvement of God. And today we're going to look at God's intentionality and his involvement in our generosity. Like how does God participate in our generosity and what are the effects of that involvement? What does it look like when God gets behind our heart of generosity and what does that mean for us? How does God put his stamp of approval on our generosity and what does that look like or mean for those who are being generous? And I think it's going to be super encouraging if you're one of those people who sacrifice for the kingdom of God or for other things beside yourself, you're going to get to see what God does in the midst of it through the word of God and go, wow, all that is happening when I embody the very heart of generosity that God has obviously been very generous to us. I'm so excited about this. It's going to be a wonderful encouragement to us all. I would love for you to turn your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, go ahead and go there now. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll look at verses 6 through 15 today. The overarching question, how does God promise to get involved in our generosity? 
Uh, and, and I want you to make sure that everything I say today, particularly today, everything I say is coming from the scripture. I, I should be saying nothing that says any more or any less than what the Bible says. That's my, my rule, my, kind of my, my goal. So is he really saying what's in the scripture? That's the question you're asking as we're going through this today. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses six through 15. How does God promise to get involved in our generosity? The first thing we're gonna see is that he will multiply it. What? He will multiply it. God promises to multiply the generosity. What in the world does that mean? Well, let's look at it together uh, in verses 6 through 11. It says this. Uh, the, 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 the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. By the way, this is a theme in the scriptures. If you can't give joyfully without compulsion, then don't give it. Because <laughs> you're not going to get glory. You're not going to get uh, uh, rewarded from heaven for doing it that way. It should be like an overflow of my heart. I want to do this. And so that's why, even in this project, would you pray over what God has in mind for you to give? And, and between you and him, we're not going to tell you what the number is. You don't have to give a thing. But will you do this out of your own heart? Each one gives as he's decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that, so that having all sufficiency in all things and at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely and he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Look what happens when God gets involved. Verse 10, he who supplies the seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. That is underlinable, that is like highlightable, that is circleable, if that's a word. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply, not might supply, will supply, certainly not in inflationary seasons, will supply. It's what it says. And multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Is anybody feeling this yet? Is that what it says? You're gonna have to talk to me now. We're not getting to lunch. Amen. Okay, thank you. Uh, you will be enriched. I, I, I don't like that word enriched because I don't, I don't, in my mind, my, I, I don't understand what that means. Literally, the idea is you'll be made rich in every way to be generous in every, uh, no, uh, You'll be made rich in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. We'll stop right there. How does God promise to get involved in our generosity? Well, he promises to multiply. That's what it says. Promises to multiply. Now, the first thing it goes starts with is the, what we call the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest, even though none of us are farmers, will understand this. Uh, the law of the harvest is very simple. It's this sowing and reaping ideology or paradigm. The more you sow, the more you reap. The, the less you sow, the less you reap. Uh, we see this used in, in, in many different circumstances in the scriptures. We see it used in relationship to money. We see it used in relation to being judgmental. The more judgment you sow, the more judgment you receive. We see this used in sin and salvation. The more sin you sow, the less, you know I mean? The, the more you receive from that sin. The more you, you sow into salvation, into sanctification, the more you receive sanctification. And a, and, a, and a salvific state. You, 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 you reap what you sow. And it's just this idea. You have seeds. Uh, you, you sow a seed into the ground. That means you put it into the ground, cover it up, and water it. And the circumstances work out to where that seed germinates and becomes a tree or it produces something. And so I can keep the seed, I can eat the seed, or I can sow it into the ground and it'll make a whole bush and make more seeds. And so the more seeds I sow into the ground, the more likelihood that I'll have a harvest later. And so whatever I'm sowing into seeds, judgmentalism, I'm going to receive judgmentalism, almost like a karma kind of a state kind of thing. Or I can sow into salvation, the sanctification, I'm going to receive the benefit of that. Uh, there's going to be a harvest time for that. And here he's using it for money. The more you invest in the kingdom of God and you sow it into the ground, the more you can expect a harvest to come later. Amen. That's what he's talking about. Farming terminology, interestingly enough, uh, there weren't farmers in, in, in Corinth. They were, it was a trade city. These guys weren't into the growing it. They were into the moving of it. 
And yet they would all understand this ideology, even though, even though they weren't farmers, just like we understand. The more seeds you put in the ground, the more likely they're germinate. If you water it, sun comes out, boom, you're gonna have a harvest one day. That's the idea. The more you see, the more you invest, the more likely you are to have a harvest. Seed must be sown into the ground so that it can germinate, so that it can produce a harvest. Now, by the way, not all seeds do this. You remember Jesus in, in his, uh, his rendition of a story where he tells about the same kind of farmer terminology. Some seed gets eaten up by the bird. Some seed hits hard ground and can't germinate. Some seeds uh, fall on shallow ground. And so it's important that seed is sown into the ground. The more seed you put into the ground, the likelier you are to have a harvest. That's the law of the harvest. It starts there. God says, just like in farming, if you sow generously into my work, you should expect a harvest. But how? What does that harvest look like? Great question. Let's go back to verse 8. Let's look at it. And God, who is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having what kind of sufficiency? All sufficiency in what kind of things? All things. And, and, and during what times? All times. Inflationary times? Yes. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And as it is written, he's distributed freely and given to the poor and his righteousness endure forever. When he finds that individual, guess what? He uses them to solve issues. Verse 10, he who supplies a seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your rights. Then what happens, and then they'll be enriched, you'll be enriched in every way, generous in every way, and those who are receiving it will have thanksgiving towards God. Here's the next level idea. God is able to make all grace abound to you and overflow to you. So that in all, in everything, at all times, having all sufficiency, you'd be able to provide for every good work that you would need to provide. There's an overflow that happens so that every good work happens. Specifically, how does he do this? He is the one who supplies seed for planting and seed for food. This is really interesting. The farmer has to make a decision. Do I take the seed and eat it? This is for my own sustenance. Or do I reserve some of that seed and plant it in the ground in hopes that there will be a harvest later? I could use it for myself or I could put it in the ground. And he says, I want you to know something. I will supply for you. I will multiply that seed that's in the storehouse. And I will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Will. Future tense. I will do this. So that you'll be made rich in every way. So that you can be generous. Here's the point. God can multiply your resources when you use them for his purposes. God can multiply your resources when you use them for his purposes. You can't outgive God. When you give to God, he can replenish your deficit by his divine grace. He can augment your loss that you incur when you're investing in the kingdom of God. I, I would challenge you to ask somebody who you know is generous. Ask them, can you tell me one story about how God's come through for you? I wish you would ask me. I'll be on the patio today. I'll give you 25 stories. And, and by the way, that just excites you to do more. Like we, my family, my wife, my wife is always more of a giver than I am. She makes me look like a peon. But anyway, she's always ready to give more. I'm like, no, bring down your number. That's not God's will. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, 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 but then you get excited. Like we've just given the biggest gift that we've ever given to any project here at, at the Welcome Project. And I'm wondering what God's going to do in the next three to four years. I really am. I could see him doing, is it going to be this? Gonna be that. I can see him doing, and when he does it, guess what? We'll do it again. We'll do it again. Ask somebody who is a giver, who is generous, and ask them how God has come through for them. I challenge you. You will hear story after story after story. How he provides, how he supplies, how he multiplies seed, how he enlarges the harvest of their righteousness. He can augment the loss. He can replenish the loss. Now, because I, I, I hear it, I'm going to have to address this. Uh, you know, wait a second. That sounds like the prosperity gospel. Now, why, 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 where are you going with this? Like, is it really God's will that all Christians become rich? I don't know that I could say that God's will is for you to be rich. Which, by the way, that whole rich idea, we're going to have to quantify that anyway and figure out what, we, what do we mean. When you say rich and when I say it's like a relative term. Like, if you own two cars, 
You're already richer than 95% of the world. You are rich. All right, so wait, God wants me to be wait, you are, does he got me to, I can't sit here and tell you that God in his will wants you to be rich or that godliness can be measured by the amount listed on your W-2. I don't, I don't, I think that's missing the whole point. It's not necessarily that God wants you to be rich, but he wants you to be rich in good deeds. It goes like this, you give and he blesses, why? So that you can give some more. And then he blesses, why would he do that? So you can give some more. And then he blesses, and why would he do that? So you could give some more. Well, that means he wants to be rich. No, you missed the whole point. <laughs> you missed the whole point. Has nothing to do with you. You're looking at the wrong part of this. He's looking at his kingdom benefit in the midst of it. It's the, what I like to call the vicious cycle of generosity. He blesses you so that you can be generous. It's nothing to do with being rich, but everything to do with being rich in good deeds. Well, why would you teach that, Pastor? It's got come so close to prosperity gospel. Why would you teach it? Oh, oh, that's a simple one. You see, we take the Bible and we put it up here in our lives. And did I say anything that, that didn't come right out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9? Now, listen, this is where I get bold. You know, if I have a verse, I get really bold. You tell me what it means then. So let's go back to that verse 10. He who supplies a seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your life. What does that mean? I've got a verse. I'll say before Jesus go, that was the verse. That's what I preached. You tell me if it works. And then you go to many people who are generous and you go, oh, it works. It's so clear it works. But they never did it for themselves. They always did it for the kingdom of God. The motivation was right. He multiplies a seed, he multiplies your su supply, your store of seed, and the harvest and the effects of the seed after you use it generously. But what else happens in the process? What else happens in the process? How does God promise to get involved in our generosity? Well, number one, he multiplies it. Number two, he'll bring blessing out of it. I want you to see this in verse 12. He brings blessing out of it. And this is, this is actually masterful. It's so cool. You got to see this. Verse 12. For the ministry of his service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So when we're generous, God gets glory. People thank him. Uh, there are 160 families who are praising God this week because they got some help from our pantry and are being thankful to God for that. By their own approval of his service, they glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Thanks goes to God. And did you see that line in verse 14? While they long for you and pray for you. They're thankful to God, and they're thankful for you and praying for you. So what ends up happening is a lot of thanksgiving God comes when we allow overflowing abundance to be able to use for the glory of God. The overflow of resources turns into an overflow of thanksgiving. God is praised by those who are benefit from the generosity, and it serves as evidence for them, puts feet to our faith to them that what we believe in is real. That happened to 160 families this week in our pantry. Specifically, there's a prayer of thanksgiving and blessing for you, because they care for you. Can you imagine going, hey, Lord Jesus, would you bless everybody who was a part of that pantry and even help give the food or, or sacrifice for the food or, 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 or pass it out? Would you bless them? Here's the deep thought. Come on, focus in, focus in. Here's the deep thought. What if God blesses you by the very prayers of those who are being blessed by you? So wait, I'm going out of my way to, to be generous towards you. You turn that into a prayer to God where you say, God bless them, and God goes, okay, I will. Are you kidding me? The very means of the blessing could be those folks praying for the folks. I wonder if those folks know that this morning, 30 years later, I prayed for them as they walked to my door and knocked on the door and gave me a box, and I was humiliated, and I shut the door really quick. They'll never know. That was a pastor in the making. And they'll never know how much I thank God for them and how much I played blessing on them for that act of kindness and mercy. 
So he multiplies resources by multiplying the prayers of those who are praising God for the help. That's the very means. That's amazing. Well, if you're new to this whole Christian thing, let me, let me just step out for a second and tell you how this relates to you. We certainly wouldn't want you to feel compul- like a compulsion to give to a God that you haven't received a gift from him yet. You see, what happens when you adopt this new worldview, this Christian worldview, we become a Christ follower, like you're following Jesus Christ in his ways. You go from like being a holiday Christian, which is like, I show up on you know, Easter and I show up on Christmas. And then you move to like what I call like a Dos Aki's Christian. I don't know if you remember that commercial, Dos Aki's commercial. You know, I don't always go to church, but when I do, I prefer Camarillo Community Church. <laughs> and from a Dos Aki's Christian, you turn into like a regular ten- attender, like more times than not, you, you, you come to church. And from there, you go into like a volunteerism. Like you, you serve in some way in capacity. Maybe it's greeting or maybe it's helping a hospitality. You join a growth group and you get you know, friends around you who are, encourage you in the, the way to live this life. And then maybe at some point you say, you know, I want to pr- make a profession of my faith. I want to get baptized. I, I want to show everybody that I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm not ashamed of you. I hung on the cross for you. Uh, bleeding for your sin, would you just take a step and, and publicly tell everybody that you're a follower of Christ? And so you get baptized, a big symbol that, that you're a follower of Christ. And maybe you jump in the membership process, you hit our pathway class and you go through there and, you, and, and part of that process, if I'm really gonna be a member, then I start desiring to be sacrificial about this thing and give. I've been given so much, my very salvation's been given to me, now I want to give back. You see, until you understand that, that God died for people that wanted nothing to do with him, that loved their sin more than they ever loved him, that, that he would take their punishment on the cross with them, offering them freedom from the penalty of sin and a pardon from eternal damnation, you're not gonna understand why, why we give. We give because we've been given so much. When Christians really understand what they've been given, of course they're going to want to give back. Of course they're going to want to invest because they've received so much. And it's the very heart of God who said, I will send my son and generously, generously allow you to have a pardon before me. We just embody that. And we invest in that message getting told to another generation. Well, We suppose we should talk about the big idea. And the big idea is this, when you let your resources overflow, God continues to resource you. When you let your resources overflow, God continues to resource you. That's how it works, you let your resources overflow, God continues to resource you. This is not the day to miss. Um, Got a little bit of object lesson today. And so we're gonna close with this, isn't that beautiful? Ooh. Uh, this is what I'm calling, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a pyramid champagne glass made out of plastic. These are plastic um, things. And by the way, they're glued, so um, they're not going to fall. <laughs> you know, as I pour in, they're glued together. And I want to thank my son, Sebastian. He's my artist in the family. He's the one who helped me glue all these points together with hot glue and made it work. And so here we have a pyramid of champagne glasses made out of plastic. And you'll see that we kind of highlighted the top one here with white. I kind of have a white stem. And the reason we did that is we want to kind of highlight and bring your eye attention to that because that re- represents you. So everybody in this room, you're going to view yourself as the top glass on this champagne pyramid uh, um, with Martinelli's because it's church. And so, and so here you have, this is you. And, 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 this, and, then, and, then, and then really the Martinelli's represents God's goodness to you, God's resources to you. Uh, this is uh, your ability to, 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 to make a living. It's your own skill set. It's all the things that you have, your, 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 your career, uh, you're moving forward, all these things that God has given you, these abilities to do all this. Your job, your career, your gifting, your prowess, your abilities, skill set, your money maker, if you view it that way. God has resourced you with all of it. And what happens is, is God blesses you and he fills your cup. And at some point, you get to the brim of this. See that? Now we're at the brim. And this is decision point. I mean, did God do this and give me all this for me? 
Is this just for me? And there are people who will become a reservoir of God's resources, a reservoir of his goodness. They will become a dam for it. And there are people who will become a river of God's goodness, a river of his resources. And and those who have become a river, he continues to pour. He just continues to pour. I know that you, if I overflow you, you will use it for the, for the glory of God. And he just continues to pour. He continues to pour. That's what we saw in first, second Corinthians chapter nine. Oh, when I give to you, you will use it for my glory. Guess what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna continue to pour. And I will overflow you, and I will overflow you, and I will overflow you. I'll just continue pouring. Because I know when I resource you, look what happens. And sometimes our focus is like, wow, look, I'm overflowing, man. And, 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 and you're missing the whole point. Yes, you're overflowing. This is not the point. Well, does that mean God's gonna make you rich? No, so clearly it overflows to other places. You're not getting rich, you're using it for God's glory. He knows that if he blesses you, look what happens. Other entities, other ministries, uh, other churches, uh, whether it's India, South Africa, wherever it might be, look what happens when I bless this person, other things keep on overflowing. And it goes down two layers and three layers deep, and he says, oh, when I, when I bless you with more resources, look what happens. Of course I'm gonna keep on just pouring it on and pouring it on and pouring it on, because look at all the glory that God's getting out of it. Two and three and four layers deep. But if you are the top up here and say, this is for me, he goes, well, then I'm done pouring it out. I do this because I know that when I overflow you, all these other things happen to the glory of God. So we focus on this glass right here. And God focuses on all this. The things that are happening for his glory. When I think of our church, Camriel Community Church, you know, I think to to myself, and this is, I'm just gonna tell you my inner thoughts. God, if you'll continue to bless us, if we grow numerically, if we continue, you, you bring us more people who give us more funds, we're not gonna spend it on ourselves. That guy in India is gonna get a church. We'll build another church in Brazil. We'll take on more missionaries. We will continue to give you glory if you bless us. That's why I came to Camarillo Community Church because we don't have a mortgage payment. So we can do more of that for the glory of God. Three, four layers deep. But we've got to reach people around the corner as well or else we're not going to be existent. And so that's why we came to the Welcome Project. When you let your resources overflow, God continues to resource you. I'm not saying that God's promised you to be rich. I don't think you will be rich. I think you'll give it away. (laughs) But when you use your resources for the glory and kingdom of God, he will continue to resource you. Ask somebody who's generous and ask them if they've seen that. Would you bow here and close your eyes with me? Father, we're in a a series where... (laughs) I mean, we were doing this God-sized thing. I don't know, I was praying this morning, can you really come through with $1.3 million? Is that, was that too much for us to bite off of? I don't know. I know that when we have to really rely on you and get on our knees and pray, it's a fun place to be because God-sized goals can only be fulfilled if God gets involved. And I love that. And so we submit a God-sized goal before you. And you have a wonderful people here. With We all have priorities. I ask you to speak to their heart. People came today, if they're like me, last minute, um, I'm gonna give my, my gift to them, I'm gonna give my commitment envelope today. But I'm not asking for a tiled lobby. I'm not asking for some fireplaces, places to sit. I'm asking for you to get glory, for you to use that to draw people, for you to bring people in this room and need Jesus Christ, for you so we can proclaim the gospel, so marriages will be saved, kids will have their parents, so, so you can transform people from the inside out like you've transformed me. I remember living on 32nd and Barrett 
remember the helicopter flying around in circles and looking for criminals. On my roof, I remember how you've turned me around, how you've moved me from out of that place. More people need it. Would you use us? I beg you, would you use us to continue to shine the light of the gospel in our community and around the world? We want to see you get more glory. Three, four, and five layers deep. That's what this is about. But I'm going to need your favor. The beautiful thing about praying for your favor is if you give it, we can't take the glory. We just throw the crowns at your feet. Give us your favor. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor David, for that encouraging message. You know, if you're here today and um, you don't yet know Jesus Christ, you may have some questions about what it means to become a Christian or to follow him. Uh, we just want you to know that we're here for you. We're, first of all, we're glad you're here. What a great place to come and explore the claims of Christ. And if you still have questions, I want to encourage you to keep coming. Um, but I also want to encourage you to seek out um, some answers. And there's people here ready to help you. If you're here in person, you can go to the welcome counter on the left-hand side of the lobby on your way out. And there's folks there who are ready to, to answer questions for you, pray for you, whatever you need. And if you're joining us online, uh, you can go to campcc.net, click on next steps. There's a form you can fill out there and one of our pastors will get back to you this week. All right. Uh, we're going to receive our offering. We do that in uh, a couple of ways. You can go to our website and click give at the top of the page at campcc.net. You can text the amount you'd like to donate to 84321. Um, or you can put your uh, it, it in the offering box in the lobby on your way out. You know, if you've, yeah, giving's awesome. It's, uh, we're going to get back to God and, and he will get the glory. That's one of the things we're going to do as a church is praise him. And this is part of our worship. Um, also, um, if this is the uh, final week of our campaign for the Welcome Project. Um, no more envelopes after this week. I know you've gotten like 18 of them. Um, but um, um, if you came prepared to give that, you can put it in the offering box. There'll be ushers at the exits with boxes. Lots of ways to turn those in. We want to make it easy. Um, we're going to have a, a, a Victory Sunday on December 4th. So next weekend's uh, kind of a weird weekend because it's a holiday weekend, but we're going to tabulate all the, everything that came in. And on December 4th, we're going to announce what God did through you guys. So if you were planning on giving and you forgot to do it today, you can still get it into me in the next, as long as I get it before December 4th, and we'll include it in the total that we announce. All right. Um, also, you can do that online. There's a welcome project page on our website where you can do all that stuff online as well. All right. Could I have the kids come on in? So um, the kids are coming up on stage today for the last uh, four weeks or five weeks. They, they started a little earlier than us. The kids have been raising money for the welcome project as well. So um, a lot of our children have been participating and they're, they were supposed to go home and ask, can I do extra chores to earn dollars? Can I rake leaves? Can I help empty the trash? Uh, whatever it is. And then they bring their dollars in and for every dollar they donated, they put a link on this chain that they're carrying uh, up onto the stage with us today. So they've been doing that. This is our... Um, pre-K or kindergarten or first grade, second grade, third grade, even fourth and fifth grade, they've been doing it. Um, and they're going to come right on up. This is so important that our kids learn to uh, worship God in this way when they're young. Um, our youth ministry is involved as well, but uh, the youth ministry is giving just like you guys are. They're making a one-time gift and a three-year commitment. And let me tell you, it's been very encouraging to see those gifts come in as well. The, the, the numbers obviously aren't the same. They're a lot lower, but it's way more encouraging to see a student say, I'm going to commit to this as well. Okay. Who... Um, we're going to find out how much money the kids raised, and I don't know this yet myself. Who am I asking? Oh, all right. So how much money did the children raise? $347. All right. Good job, kids. Thank you for participating. <laughs> all right. 
check out this video before we leave. Good morning. I'm Clara Chisholm, and I'm part of the high school ministry here at CAMCC. I'm so glad you're here. If you're a first, second, or third time guest, we have some fantastic gifts for you to thank you for hanging out with us today. It's like Christmas came early. I'm talking Starbucks gift cards, mugs, and dessert. Go to the welcome counter in the lobby with your connection card, or if you're watching online, go to camcc.net slash next steps. This Christmas season is a great time to invite friends, family, coworkers, and neighbors to join you at the many great up and coming things here at CAMCC. Sunday, December 11th, Pictures with Santa. Following both gathering hours, 9 and 1045, get your family picture with Santa for free. Don't wait in long lines at the mall, show up looking Christmassy, and you'll have the perfect cover for your annual Christmas card. Bring a family to join you and your smiles. Sunday, December 11th, 4.30 p.m. Award-winning artist Mary Rice Hopkins featuring Brush Arbor performing hits and holiday favorites for the entire family to enjoy. She will be joined by special guest Puppets with a Heart by Darcy Mays as seen on TVN. Tickets and packages available at campcc.net. Saturday, December 17th, 5.30 to 9.30 p.m., Parents Night Out. Drop off your kids here at the church and enjoy a date night out. Or maybe you need to finish your Christmas shopping or wrapping. This is your night. Donations accepted and will help fund Awana Summer Camp. For questions, contact awana at camcc.net. Saturday, December 24th, the Christmas Eve candlelight gatherings, 4 and 6 p.m. Join us for our dynamic and powerful Christmas Eve gathering with upbeat live music, delicious holiday sweet treats, festive family photos, and classic carols. Child care will be provided for birth to pre-K. This will be an evening you will not want to miss. We will not be holding gatherings on Christmas Day so that you can all spend time with your families, which is why we're offering two gatherings on Christmas Eve. So get here early to get a seat. Who will you ask to join you as your guest? Sunday, January 15th, baptisms. We'll be having baptisms for both worship gatherings. If you would like to take the next step in your faith, mark your connection card, baptisms, or go to camcc.net slash next steps, and Pastor Daryl will get in touch with you or answer any questions you might have. You don't even have to sign up. We'll have everything you need if you decide to make the decision that morning, a true outward expression of an inward change. For more info, contact Daryl at camcc.net. To stay in the loop of what's going on at CAMCC, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more info on any of these events, go to camcc.net. Thank you, Pastor Dave, for that message. And just as he was speaking and sharing about how he can remember times when he was generous that God blessed him. And it just helped me to remember as I step out in faith um, with the number that our family chose to give to this project, just how many times God was faithful through other church expansion projects or just things, uh, ministries that God brought into our lives, like the Romania dinner that we had last week, just what a blessing um, to be able to give from what God's given us, our resources to others and see what he does. And remember, if you are a guest, you can go on out to the welcome counter. We have a gift for you. And if you're online, you can go to camcc.net slash next steps and we'll be in contact with you there. Let's head on out to the patio. We've got donuts and coffee. Just hang out, enjoy a great Sunday and happy Thanksgiving.